Welcome to Fun Islamic Facts, where I share fun facts about Muhammad and the Quran whenever jihadis go on a killing spree. In fun fact number nine, we saw Muhammad commanding his followers to dunk flies into their food and drinks, even though we know that flies carry diseases such as typhoid, cholera, dysentery, anthrax, salmonella, and tuberculosis. But the prophet who told his followers to dunk flies into their food and drinks also told them to lick each other's fingers. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5456. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the prophet said, when you eat, do not wipe your hands till you have licked it or had it licked by somebody else. Sorry, they're already gone. No, they're not. You left the best part. No, I'm pretty sure they're... Mmm, cheese. Sahih Muslim, 5294. It was narrated that Ibn Abbas said, The Messenger of Allah said, When one of you eats some food, let him not wipe his hand until he has licked it or had it licked. Mmm, cheese. I love Doritos. Why did Muhammad want his followers to lick their fingers and to lick each other's fingers? He tells us, Sahih Muslim 5300. It was narrated from Jabir that the Prophet enjoined licking one's fingers and wiping the plate. And he said, You do not know in which part the blessing is. So, Allah has hidden a blessing somewhere in your food. But since you don't know where it's hidden, you should lick your fingers or have someone else lick them so that the blessing isn't lost. Muhammad goes on to say that even if you drop your food on the floor, you should pick it up and eat it so that Satan doesn't eat what you dropped and steal your hidden blessing. Sahih Muslim, number 5303. It was narrated that Jabir said, I heard the prophet say, the shaitan is present with any one of you in all his affairs and he is even present with him when he eats. If one of you drops a morsel, let him remove any dirt on it, then eat it, and not leave it for the shaitan. And when he is finished, let him lick his fingers, for he does not know in which part of his food the blessing is. Unfortunately for Muslims who actually believe what Muhammad says, the problem with food that falls on the floor isn't simply the dirt. It's the bacteria, which remain on the food even after the dirt is brushed away. Likewise, sucking other people's fingers will transfer any germs they're carrying to your own body. So, once again, the surest way to infect yourself with the disease and die is to follow Muhammad's teachings. Welcome to Islam. Finger licking dumb. The greatest threat to terrorist groups like the Islamic State the Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and Al-Qaeda is not a UN resolution or the US military. The greatest threat to terrorists is an informed population, because only an informed population can undermine the ideology that gives rise to jihad. With this in mind, let's go through 10 facts about the Quran, history's most effective manual for violently subjugating nations and cultures. Fact number one, the word Quran means recitation. The Quran is something that's supposed to be recited from memory. Muhammad and his companions weren't big on reading, and in Muhammad's time, portions of the Quran were only written down as memory aids. It wasn't until later that some of his followers came up with the idea of putting it all together into book form. So, why would Muslims want to recite the Quran? Because, fact number two, Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah. The angel Gabriel, as the story goes, delivered verses to Muhammad, and Muhammad passed these verses on to his followers. But as far as the Quran is concerned, Gabriel and Muhammad were male men. It's the word of Allah, not the words of Gabriel or Muhammad. Why do Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah? Because, fact number three, Muhammad said so. The Quran was supposedly revealed to one man, Muhammad. 
unlike the Bible, which contains numerous shorter works written by around 40 different authors, the Quran stands or falls with the lone testimony of Muhammad, a guy whose first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic, a guy who repeatedly tried to kill himself, a guy who believed he was the victim of magic spells that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs, a guy who delivered verses to his followers and later blamed the devil for tricking him, a guy who had sex with a nine-year-old girl, had nine wives at one time, even though the Quran says Muslims can only have four, married the divorced wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce, told his followers it's okay to beat their wives into submission, and so on. So, what evidence did Muhammad offer to show that his revelations were from Allah? Fact number four, Muhammad's main argument for the inspiration of the Quran was what we'll call the argument from literary excellence, one of the silliest arguments ever offered by anyone for anything. My poetry is better than your poetry, so my poetry must be the inspired word of Allah. The idea is that no one can produce something as wonderful as or more wonderful than the Quran. Now, there are all kinds of things we could do to make the Quran better than it is. We could take out the verses about slaughtering unbelievers or about raping female captives or about having sex with prepubescent girls. But one simple way to improve the Quran would be to put it in chronological order. Because, fact number five, the Quran is not arranged chronologically. Apart from the first chapter, which is a short prayer, the rest of the Quran is basically arranged from the longest chapters to the shortest chapters. But the longer chapters were generally much later than the shorter chapters, so the Quran is thoroughly disorganized, making it very difficult to read. You might not care about the order, but it's actually extremely important because, fact number six, some parts of the Quran abrogate or cancel other parts of the Quran. Later revelations typically abrogate earlier revelations, but since the Quran isn't arranged chronologically, we don't know which verses are canceled and which verses still apply without massive collections of commentaries to help sift through this mess. You'll recall that the Quran's main argument for its divine origin is that it's so incredibly well written. It must be from God. Yeah, it's so wonderfully written that no one can understand what they're supposed to do without consulting a team of scholars. This is my modern take on the Quran. What did Muhammad's contemporaries think of it? Fact number seven, Muhammad's contemporaries were convinced that the Quran was plagiarized from earlier sources. How do we know what they thought about the Quran? We know because the Quran repeatedly tells us that Muhammad's contemporaries accused him of stealing his stories from others. How did Muhammad respond to charges of plagiarism? He declared that, fact number eight, the Quran is a continuation of previous scriptures. The reason so much of the Quran sounded so familiar to the people of Arabia wasn't that Muhammad was plagiarizing earlier sources. Those earlier sources were also the word of Allah. That's why they sounded the same. Of course, Muslims today know that those earlier sources thoroughly contradict the Quran, so they're forced to claim that the earlier sources were corrupted. This is extremely odd because, fact number nine, the Quran was only compiled into a book because much of it was lost. According to Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were forgotten. Large passages came up missing. Verses vanished. This was in spite of the fact that Allah promised, he promised in chapter 15, verse 9, to protect the Quran from corruption. He couldn't do it, which calls into question the rest of what he said. Why is this relevant? Because, fact number 10, the Quran is the highest authority on matters of Sharia. Raping captives, beating women into submission, chopping off hands for stealing, grown men marrying little girls. These things come from this book, which most certainly is not the word of God. Learn these facts, my friends, and share them with others. If you like the sources for anything I've said in this video, click on the link in the description box. It's all there, waiting for you to do your part in throwing a great big freedom-sized monkey wrench in the jihad machine. And since there's much more the world needs to know about Islam, click on this subscribe button so you'll know when I post my next video, which I assure you will be awesome. For nearly 2,000 years, Christians have proclaimed Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. Islam rejects all three of these core doctrines and offers a different account of who Jesus was and what happened at the cross and afterwards. But the Islamic account comes at a terrible price. In order to reject Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, Islam has to portray God as a horrible deceiver and Jesus as the most stupendous failure in the history of the prophets. So, while Muslims claim that Allah is the truth and that Jesus is to be revered as one of Allah's mightiest prophets, these claims are hollow 
because a closer examination shows what Islam really teaches about God and Jesus. To understand the theological incoherence that emerges from Muhammad's teachings about Jesus, we're going to look at 10 facts. And when I say 10 facts, I mean 10 facts that even Muslims have to grant. They're either facts about what Islam teaches or historical facts that Muslims can't deny. Based on these 10 facts, we're then going to ask 10 questions. And as we'll see, the Islamic answers to these questions will leave us wondering how Muslims can possibly expect us to take their theology seriously. Fact number one. According to the Quran, Jesus was a prophet of Islam. No Muslim is going to deny this since it comes directly from the Quran, Surah 42, verse 13. The same religion has he established for you as that which he enjoined on Noah, that which we have sent by inspiration to you, O Muhammad, and that which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, namely, that you should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein. So Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad were all prophets of Allah, and they all preached the same religion. According to the Quran, Surah 19, verses 23 to 33, Jesus began preaching Islam when he was still a baby. Fact number two. According to the Quran, a number of Jesus' listeners believed his message and became Muslims. Jesus didn't just preach Islam, he had a successful ministry and won converts. Surah 3, verse 52. When Jesus found unbelief on their, i.e. the Jews' part, he said, Who will be my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples said, We are Allah's helpers. We believe in Allah, so bear witness that we are Muslims. Surah 5, verse 111. And behold, when I inspired the disciples of Jesus to believe in me and my messenger, they said, We believe, so bear witness that we are Muslims. Jesus had Muslim followers in the first century. Fact number three. In the Quran, Allah promises Jesus that his followers will be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection. When Allah informs Jesus that he's about to be taken to heaven, he also tells him not to worry about his followers because Allah himself is going to protect them. Surah 3, verse 55. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take you and raise you to myself and clear you of the falsehoods of those who disbelieve. I will make those who follow you superior to those who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. Then shall you all return to me, and I will judge between you concerning the matters in which you differ. Allah is going to protect Jesus' followers and make them superior to the unbelievers until the day of resurrection. That is a long time. Since the day of resurrection hasn't gotten here yet, Jesus' followers are still under Allah's protection. We have been all along. Fact number four. If there were any first century Jews who converted to Islam after hearing Jesus preach, they didn't last very long. The claim that Jesus' followers were Muslims raises an obvious question. Why have we never heard of any first century Muslim followers of Jesus? We have a ton of historical information about Jesus' first century followers, but we have no evidence at all of any Muslims. We have both Christian and non-Christian sources that tell us what Jesus' followers believed, yet none of these sources suggest that Jesus' followers believed anything remotely resembling Islam. We know about followers of Jesus who worshipped him and proclaimed his death for sins and his resurrection from the dead, so they're clearly not Muslims. What happened to the Muslims? The most obvious conclusion to draw here is that the Quran is wrong when it says that Jesus' followers were Muslims. But we're going to be as generous as possible to our Muslim friends and simply say that, assuming Jesus had Muslim followers, they didn't last very long. They didn't last long enough to leave any sort of record. Clearly, if Jesus' Muslim followers had been around for several centuries, we would have some sort of evidence that they at least existed. But we don't. So even Muslims have to acknowledge that if Jesus had Muslim followers, they disappeared quickly and didn't leave much of a historical footprint. Fact number five. According to the Quran, Allah helped Jesus' followers gain the upper hand over the Jews who rejected Jesus. 
We've already seen that Allah promised to make Jesus' followers superior until the day of resurrection. In Surah 61, verse 14 of the Quran, Allah goes on to say that he aided Jesus' followers until they became uppermost over their enemies. The verse reads, O you who believe, be helpers in the cause of Allah, as Jesus, son of Mary, said to his disciples, Who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples said, We are helpers in the cause of Allah. So a party of the children of Israel believed, and another party disbelieved. Then we aided those who believed against their enemy, and they became uppermost. Now, when did Jesus' followers become uppermost over the Jews who rejected Jesus? The Quran says that Allah helped them until they became uppermost, so it must have happened according to Islam. But in the first century, Jesus' followers were a persecuted minority under constant threat. So Allah helped them sometime later and turned the tide. When was that? Fact number six. The only followers of Jesus who ever became more powerful than the Jews were Christians who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. We'll recall that assuming Jesus had Muslim followers, they didn't last very long. They never became uppermost over anyone. We have absolutely no evidence that they even existed. But some followers of Jesus did become uppermost. The problem for Muslims is that we know what these followers believed, and it wasn't Islam. Interestingly, Muslim commentators admit that the Quran is referring to the Christians who took over the Roman Empire. In his commentary on Surah 61, verse 14 of the Quran, Yusuf Ali says this, A portion of the children of Israel, the one that really cared for the truth, believed in Jesus and followed his guidance, but the greater portion of them were hard-hearted and remained in their beaten track of formalism and false racial pride. The majority seemed at first to have the upper hand when they thought they had crucified Jesus and killed his message, but they were soon brought to their senses. Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus in AD 70, and the Jews have been scattered ever since. The wandering Jew has become a byword in many literatures. On the other hand, those who followed Jesus permeated the Roman Empire, brought many new races within their circle, and through the Roman Empire, Christianity became the predominant religion of the world until the advent of Islam. Christians became uppermost when they took over the Roman Empire. But we know exactly what these Christians believed. They believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. So these were the followers of Jesus Allah aided until they became uppermost. Fact number seven. The Quran states that the Injil, the Gospel, was given as a guidance for mankind. We've seen that Allah sent various prophets into the world, Noah, Abraham, and so on. But Allah didn't just send prophets, He also inspired books. For instance, the Quran affirms the inspiration of the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran in Surah 3, verses 3 to 4. He, Allah, has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for mankind, and he revealed the criterion. The criterion is usually interpreted to mean the Quran. So Allah gave the Gospel as a guidance for mankind. Allah's goal was to guide mankind with the Gospel. Was Allah successful, or did human beings stop him from achieving his goal? Let's find out. Fact number eight. According to the Quran, Christians still possessed the gospel during Muhammad's time. Contrary to Muslims in our time who claim that the gospel has been corrupted, the Quran asserts that no one can change Allah's words. Surah 18, verse 27, And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. Not surprisingly, since the Quran insists that the gospel is the word of Allah and that no one can change Allah's words, it also declares that 7th century Christians were still reading the Torah and the gospel. In Surah 7, verse 157, Allah declares, Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. How can we find Muhammad written down with us in the gospel if we don't have the gospel? Is the Quran saying that there are parts 
about Muhammad that are reliable even though other parts have been corrupted? How would we know that the parts about Muhammad weren't among the corrupted parts? What's the point of appealing to a book to validate your profit if you're simultaneously claiming that the book you're appealing to has been corrupted? But the Quran doesn't just say that Christians were still reading the gospel in the time of Muhammad. It also commands Christians to judge by the gospel. Surah 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. Whoever fails to judge by what Allah has revealed, they are the transgressors. If the gospel has been corrupted, Christians have nowhere else to turn because in Surah 5, verse 68, Allah tells Muhammad to say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. So if Allah revealed the gospel, and no one can change Allah's words, and Christians were reading the gospel during the time of Muhammad, and Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel, and says that we have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon the gospel, it's clear that, according to the Quran, Christians still had the gospel during the time of Muhammad. This means that the gospel had been accurately and reliably transmitted from the first century all the way down to the seventh century. Fact number nine. If there was a first century gospel fundamentally different from the New Testament gospels, it was corrupted immediately or lost entirely. The four gospels from the second century onward were treated as a unit called the fourfold gospel or simply the gospel. But this fourfold gospel affirms Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity as fundamental doctrines. Since the Quran tells us that Allah inspired the gospel, and we know that the gospel we have contradicts Islam, Muslims are forced to claim that the gospel has been corrupted. But we have thousands of manuscripts of the gospel, and none of them agrees with Islam. So what happened to the gospel that Allah inspired? Here again, the most obvious conclusion to draw is that the Quran is simply wrong when it claims that there was once an Islamic gospel. But once again, we're going to be as generous as possible to our Muslim friends and we'll only say that if there was an Islamic gospel, it was corrupted very early on or lost completely. We have no record of its existence, so it couldn't have made a significant impact. Hence, even Muslims who believe in an Islamic gospel have to grant this point. Fact number 10. According to Islam, Allah tricked the Jews into believing that they had crucified Jesus. We know historically that Jesus' death by crucifixion was common knowledge among ancient authorities, and that Jesus' earliest followers, including Peter, James, and John, came to believe that Jesus had died on the cross for their sins and that he had risen from the dead. All four New Testament Gospels confirm the early Christian belief in Jesus' death and resurrection, as does the book of Acts. Paul's letters also repeatedly proclaim Jesus' death and resurrection. An ancient Christian creed recorded in 1 Corinthians 15 has been dated to within a few years of Jesus' life and therefore provides extremely early testimony about Christian beliefs during the time of the apostles. The creed tells us that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead. We also have early Christian writings from outside the New Testament that report the beliefs of Jesus' followers. For instance, Clement of Rome, who was ordained as Bishop of Rome by the Apostle Peter, writes about the Apostle's belief in Jesus' resurrection. Polycarp, who was ordained by the Apostle John, mentions Jesus' resurrection numerous times. There are even several non-Christian sources that report crucial information about Jesus and the Apostles. According to both the Jewish historian Josephus and the Roman historian Tacitus, Jesus was crucified during the reign of Pontius Pilate. But Islam asserts that Jesus never died and that he therefore didn't rise from the dead. If Islam is correct, why did so many people, Christian and non-Christian, think that Jesus died by crucifixion? Well, according to the Quran, Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion. As we read in Surah 4, verses 157 to 158, They, the Jews, said, We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety, 
they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up to himself, and Allah is exalted in power, wise. They killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. What does the Quran mean when it says that it was made to appear to them that they had killed and crucified Jesus? There are several stories about what happened to Jesus in the Muslim sources, but they're variations on what's called substitution theory. Substitution theory is the theory that Jesus wasn't crucified because Allah took someone else and disguised him to make him look like Jesus. And this other person was then crucified in Jesus' place as his substitute. We have different Muslim stories about the identity of this other person, but the most popular Muslim view today is that it was Judas. Jesus wasn't crucified. Allah disguised Judas and made him look like Jesus. Then Judas was crucified, but everyone thought that it was Jesus because Allah made it appear to them that Jesus was crucified. If the Muslim view is correct, where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died on the cross? We didn't get this idea from the Apostle Paul or from the Council of Nicaea. We got the idea from Allah, who did such an amazing job tricking everyone that nearly 20 centuries of Christians and non-Christians have been thoroughly convinced that Jesus died by crucifixion. And don't forget that belief in Jesus' death is foundational to Christianity. There's no Christianity without belief in Jesus' death. So without Allah tricking people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion, there would be no Christianity. Allah, through trickery and deception, helped start Christianity. So these are our 10 facts, facts that our Muslim friends can't deny. One, according to the Quran, Jesus was a prophet of Islam. Two, according to the Quran, a number of Jesus' listeners believed his message and became Muslims. Three, in the Quran, Allah promises Jesus that his followers will be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection. For if there were any first century Jews who converted to Islam after hearing Jesus preach, they didn't last very long. Five, according to the Quran, Allah helped Jesus' followers gain the upper hand over the Jews who rejected Jesus. Six, the only followers of Jesus who ever became more powerful than the Jews were Christians who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. Seven, the Quran states that the Injil, the Gospel, was given as a guidance for mankind. Eight, according to the Quran, Christians still possessed the Gospel during Muhammad's time. Nine, if there was a first century Gospel fundamentally different from the New Testament Gospels, it was corrupted immediately or lost entirely. Ten, according to Islam, Allah tricked the Jews into believing that they had crucified Jesus. Now that we've established these ten facts, we have 10 questions for our Muslim friends. Question number one. Assuming that the Muslim view is correct, what happened to Jesus' Muslim followers? The Quran tells us that Jesus' followers were Muslims, but we have no record of any Muslim followers of Jesus, so they must have disappeared rather quickly. What happened to them? Since we know about early Christians who believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, and since Allah led people to believe in Jesus' death through the power of illusion, the only way to reconcile the Islamic claim with history is to conclude that Jesus' Muslim followers were led astray by Allah. That is, they came to believe that Jesus died by crucifixion, and since many people were convinced that Jesus had appeared to them alive again, these Muslim followers also must have come to believe that he rose from the dead. In other words, Islam teaches that Jesus' followers were Muslims, but all the followers of Jesus we know about in the first century believed in his death and resurrection. How did we get from Muslims to Christians? Well, they needed belief in Jesus' death by crucifixion, and that belief was supplied by Allah when he disguised someone to make him look like Jesus. So Allah led people away from the truth about Jesus. Question number two. Why would Allah lead Jesus' followers astray and destroy everything Jesus had worked so hard to accomplish? According to Islam, Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived the most miraculous life in history, and Allah raised him up to heaven alive. Allah clearly had big plans for Jesus, and Jesus was successful. People converted to Islam when he preached. But then Jesus' followers became convinced that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Where did they get that idea? They got it from Allah, who tricked and deceived them. Why would Allah do that? 
Why would Allah send Jesus with so many miracles only to destroy everything Jesus had worked so hard to accomplish by starting Christianity? Question number three. Why did Allah tell Jesus that his followers would be superior until the day of resurrection? Remember that in Surah 3, verse 55, Allah promised Jesus that he would make his followers superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection. But those same followers became Christians and dedicated their lives to preaching that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. Why didn't Allah tell Jesus, sorry, but after I take you safely to heaven, I'm going to trick your followers into believing that you died, and I'm going to start the world's largest false religion in the process. Was Allah lying to Jesus, in which case he's immoral and lies to his prophets? Or did Allah just not know what was going to happen, in which case he's ignorant? Which one is he, immoral or ignorant? He has to be one or the other if he promised Jesus that he would make his followers superior until the day of resurrection, but instead tricked them into inventing a false religion. Question number four. If the gospel was given as a guidance to mankind, why didn't Allah preserve his message rather than help start a heresy? Allah says in the Quran that he gave the gospel as a guidance to mankind, but we have no record anywhere of any Islamic gospel. So whom, we have to ask, did this book ever guide? If Allah wanted to give people a book but was prevented from reaching his goal, it seems that someone must have overpowered Allah. Interestingly, notice that the gospel we have today tells us that Jesus died by crucifixion. According to Muslims, that's a corruption. But where did that corruption come from? It came from Allah when he tricked people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion. So at least part of Allah's book, which he delivered as a guidance for mankind, was corrupted by Allah himself. Why would Allah corrupt his own book and start a false religion instead of just protecting the book that he had sent as a guidance. Question number five. If the Islamic gospel was corrupted so quickly that we have no evidence that it ever existed, why did Allah say that it was still available during Muhammad's time? Allah gave the gospel as a guidance. Then it was corrupted by Allah and others. We know what the gospel said in the first century and it affirms Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. So it must have been corrupted in the first century. But if the gospel was corrupted in the first century, why does Allah tell Muhammad in the seventh century that no one can change his words, that Christians still had the gospel, that Christians have to judge by the gospel, and that Christians have no ground to stand upon if they do not stand fast by the gospel? Did Allah forget that he and others had corrupted the gospel centuries earlier, in which case his memory was failing? Or did Allah remember that he and others had corrupted the gospel, but he was just lying to Muhammad about no one being able to change his words and Christians still reading and judging by the gospel, in which case he was once again deceiving his own prophets, lying to Muhammad about preserving the gospel like he lied to Jesus about protecting his followers until the day of resurrection. Question number six. If Allah is powerless to stop people from corrupting his message, can we even trust the Quran? Allah repeatedly says in the Quran that no one can change his words. And Allah gave the gospel as a guidance for mankind. But then he corrupted part of it, so he can obviously change his own words. And other people corrupted other parts, which means that people can corrupt his words. Now, if Allah gave the gospel as a guidance, but just couldn't protect it, he must not be as powerful as he thinks. And if Allah couldn't protect the gospel, which he gave as a guidance for mankind, how could he protect the Quran, which he also gave as a guidance for mankind? Did Allah suddenly gain new abilities when Muhammad came along? In the first century, he couldn't protect his words, not from himself and not from others. But in the seventh century, he could suddenly protect his words? Unless our Muslim friends want us to believe that Allah changed significantly somewhere between the first and the seventh century, the God who was protecting the Quran was the same God who could never protect his other revelations. Maybe this is why Islam's most trusted sources talk about the Quran being changed so many times, entire chapters coming up missing, large passages coming up missing, verses being eaten by a goat. 
This all makes sense if Allah just can't protect his words. But if Allah can't protect his words, why does he say over and over again that no one can change his words? Again, is he ignorant? Does he just not realize that his words have been changed over and over again? Or does he know that people are changing his words, but he keeps lying about it to protect himself from embarrassment? Question number seven. Once the Christian heresy had started, why did Allah help the Christians rise to power? So there were first century Muslims, and then there were Christians who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. Which followers of Jesus became uppermost? Well, the first century Muslims completely disappeared from history. The followers of Jesus who became uppermost were the ones who believed in his death, resurrection, and deity. But Allah, in Surah 61, verse 14, says that he aided the followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. Did he pick the wrong ones, in which case he's ignorant? Or did he deliberately help the heretical followers of Jesus who were preaching a false religion? Or did he really want to help the Muslim followers of Jesus, but his ability to help people didn't kick in until it was too late and Jesus' message had been corrupted by Allah? In the first century, Christians were a small, persecuted group in the Roman Empire, but Christianity eventually became the largest religion in history. How did it go from being a tiny, persecuted religion to being the largest religion in history? According to the Quran, who helped Christians become uppermost? Allah did. Allah helped Christians rise to power. But Christianity is false, according to Islam. So Allah not only helped start a false religion by tricking people into believing that Jesus died on the cross, he also helped it become the most popular religion in history. Is it just me, or does Allah sound hopelessly confused at best, or maliciously deceptive at worst? Question number eight. If Allah deceives people who follow his prophets, how do Muslims know that he isn't deceiving them? According to Islam, Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion. The obvious question that arises is, why would he do a thing like that? He certainly didn't do it to protect Jesus. Jesus was taken safely to heaven. So why would Allah want people to believe that Jesus died on the cross when Jesus never died on the cross? Why would he want people to believe something that's false? Why would he want to give Jesus' enemies the satisfaction of seeing him killed? Why not raise Jesus up without deceiving anyone? There seems to be no reason at all for Allah to deceive these people, especially since the deception misled Jesus' followers, corrupted the gospel, and led to the formation of Christianity, the largest false religion in history. So if there's just no reason for Allah to trick people here, and if he even ended up tricking people who had converted to Islam, we have to ask, how do our Muslim friends know that he isn't tricking them? Allah, according to the Quran, tricks and deceives people, even people who follow his prophets, for no reason whatsoever. I have no idea how our Muslim friends sleep at night when they believe in a God who starts false religions, helps spread those false religions, and deceives people who are trying desperately to follow him. By the way, I'm not the only one to realize this. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion and the first of the rightly guided caliphs, said that if he had one foot in paradise, he would still fear Allah's deception. Now there's a Muslim who understood the implications of believing in an omnipotent deceiver. Question number nine. Since Allah deceived people about Jesus, and since he couldn't protect the rest of Jesus' message, what did Jesus ultimately accomplish? Muslims claim that Jesus was one of Allah's mightiest prophets, but if we take a closer look, we can see that if Islam is true, Jesus was the greatest failure in the history of the prophets. Since he started preaching Islam at birth, he had more than 30 years to convince people to believe in Allah. But after he was taken away, the children of Israel were divided into two broad camps. Those who believed his message became Christians all of whom were guilty of the worst sin imaginable, shirk, while those who rejected his message were guilty of rejecting one of Allah's mightiest messengers. So whether people believed in Jesus or rejected him, they would all ultimately be condemned and cast into the hellfire. Jesus didn't manage to win a single lasting convert to Islam. His Muslim followers were led astray by Allah. His message was corrupted by Allah. So according to Islam, Jesus accomplished absolutely nothing of any lasting significance. 
and Muslims claim to respect Jesus. Question number 10. How does all of this compare with the Christian view? Muslims claim to have a superior view of God, but they believe in a deity who deceives people for no reason, starts false religions, overthrows the work of his prophets, and is powerless to preserve his message, even though he calls himself the truth, promises to protect those who follow his prophets, and boasts that no one can change his words. Muslims claim to have a superior view of Jesus, but they believe that he accomplished nothing of any lasting significance and that he was utterly incompetent at choosing disciples. Not one of Jesus' disciples managed to protect his message from corruption, although we can't really blame them since Allah was the one who tricked them into corrupting the message that he had given as a guidance to mankind. If Islam is true, God is ignorant and deceptive, Jesus was irrelevant and incompetent, and Jesus' followers were weak-willed and unreliable. Islam is one massive insult to God, to Jesus, and to Jesus' followers. As with so many of Islam's claims, we find superficial reverence, but deep blasphemy. On the surface, Islam looks like it promotes reverence for God and respect for Jesus. But as soon as we dig a little deeper, we find blasphemous, incoherent nonsense. This is exactly what we should expect from a false religion. Reverence on the surface, blasphemy below the surface. Superficial reverence, deep blasphemy. Christianity, by contrast, honors God. The God of the Bible is perfect in his attributes. According to Christianity, God's justice is perfect, so all sin must be punished. If God let some sin slide, he wouldn't be perfect in his justice. But God's love and mercy are also perfect, which means that he's vastly more loving than we are, so much so that he's willing to take the punishment that we deserve upon himself. God loves sinners so much that he entered into creation in order to pay the price for our sins. As Jesus of Nazareth, he fulfilled his mission perfectly and suffered for our sake so that we could stand before God with the righteousness of Christ. He taught the good news, the gospel, to his followers. He appeared to them as their risen Lord, and he sent them the Holy Spirit to fill and empower them. These followers endured torture and death to preach the gospel to people who were lost and to make sure that the gospel would reach us. So God was completely victorious. Jesus was completely victorious. And Jesus' followers, by God's grace, were completely victorious. Christianity doesn't promote superficial reverence. It promotes deep reverence. Jesus warned his followers that false prophets would come. He also commanded us not to believe them. One of the ways we can spot false prophets is by carefully discerning when their teachings insult and demean God and diminish God's perfect attributes. God is truth and God is love. Islam, when carefully examined, would have us believe otherwise. It's no secret that the Quran and I have had our differences in the past. But I'm a man of peace and love, so to avoid ongoing hostility and conflict, I'd like to extend an olive branch by sharing my favorite verse of the Quran. You might think that my favorite Quran verse is the verse I quote most frequently, Surah 9, verse 29, where Allah commands Muslims to violently subjugate Jews and Christians. But this isn't my favorite Quran verse at all. I just quote it a lot to help people understand 14 centuries of jihad. Since Surah 9, verse 29 isn't my favorite Quran verse, you might think that I'm referring to one of the amusing verses I often use to refute common Muslim arguments. For instance, when Muslims claim that the Quran contains scientific miracles, I like to point out that the Quran says that Dhul Karnain traveled so far west he found the place where the sun sets, and that the sun sets in a muddy pool, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons to keep them from sneaking into paradise and listening to his secret plans, and that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. As helpful as these verses are, however, they're not my favorite. My favorite verse of the Quran is found in Surah 33, Surat al-Azab, one of the most freakishly disturbing chapters of the Quran. And that's saying something. 
What's amazing about Surah 33 is that, as nauseating as it is, we only have about a third of what it originally said. What we have today is what was left after Muhammad's wives and others sanitized it by removing some of the most abominable and sickening parts. Muslim sources show that more than a hundred verses of Surah 33 are now missing. In Abu Ubaid's Kitab Fada'al al-Quran, Aisha declares, Surat al-Azab, Surah 33, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than there is in it today. Surah 33 in today's Quran only has 73 verses, but it originally had around 200. That's a lot of missing verses. And we know what some of these missing verses said. In Sunan ibn Majah, 1944, we read, It was narrated that Aisha said, The verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. We discussed the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times in my Sheepgate video, which I'll link to at the end of this video in case you haven't seen it yet. In brief, before more than a hundred verses were removed from Surah 33, one of the verses said that if a man and a woman aren't married to each other but they need to be alone together for some reason, the woman is required to breastfeed the man ten times so that he'll feel like her son and won't be tempted to have sex with her. So according to Allah, the proper Islamic way for women to avoid sexually arousing men is to put their breasts into men's mouths this many times. Fortunately, Muhammad's wives had a better understanding of human nature than Allah did. So they conspired to remove that verse and other verses when Muhammad died after he was poisoned to death by a Jewish woman whose family had been slaughtered by Muslims. But in my humble opinion, Muhammad's wives should have taken out the entire chapter. Keep in mind, this is the chapter where Allah gives Muhammad special permission to break the four wife limit. Muslims are allowed to marry up to four women and girls. But in Surah 33 verse 50, Allah tells Muhammad that he can have as many wives as he wants. How convenient that the man who was receiving the revelations got the most sex partners. This is also the chapter where Allah orders Muhammad to marry the wife of his own adopted son after Muhammad causes the divorce by lusting after her. Since marrying the divorced wife of your own adopted son was frowned upon in 7th century Arabia, Allah decided to abolish adoption in Surah 33 verses 4 to 5. Adoption, of course, is one of the most loving, humane practices in human history, and Allah abolishes it so that Muhammad can have the wife of his own adopted son. Anywho, this utterly detestable chapter is the chapter that contains my favorite Quran verse. My favorite verse of the Quran is Surah 33 verse 53. Surah 33 verse 53 is my favorite verse because it shows beyond any rational doubt what the Quran really is. The historical background of the verse is that Muhammad would sometimes invite people to one of his many houses for dinner. But people would show up early or stay late because they wanted to talk to him and ask him questions. Muhammad didn't want these people hanging around, but he was too shy to tell them that they were annoying him. That's when Allah stepped in and revealed Surah 33, verse 53. O oh, you who believe, enter not the Prophet's houses unless permission is given to you for a meal and then not so early as to wait for its preparation. But when you are invited, enter, and when you have taken your meal, disperse without sitting for a talk. Verily, such behavior annoys the prophet, and he is shy of asking you to go. But Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. And when you ask his wives for anything you want, ask them from behind a screen that is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. And it is not right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him, i.e. after his death. Verily, with Allah, that shall be an enormity. Now, think about this. 
Muhammad doesn't like people showing up early for dinner or hanging out afterwards. He's a busy man, and Islam's most trusted sources say that he liked to have sex with all nine of his wives on the same night, as we read in Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5068. Narrated Anas, the Prophet used to go around, have sexual relations with, all his wives in one night, and he had nine wives. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5215. Narrated Anas bin Malik, the Prophet used to pass by, have sexual relations with, all his wives in one night, and at that time he had nine wives. Sahih al-Bukhari, 268. Narrated Qatada, Anas bin Malik said, the Prophet used to visit all his wives in a round, during the day and night, and they were eleven in number. I asked Anas, had the Prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say that the Prophet was given the strength of thirty men. And Saeed said, on the authority of Qatada, that Anas had told him about nine wives only, not eleven. Surah 33, verse 50, gives Muhammad special permission to have more sexual partners than anyone else. And Muhammad wants to go from house to house, having sex with nine women and girls a night. Now, obviously, if you're trying to have sex with nine women and girls a night, not counting your slave girls, you don't have a lot of time for chit-chat. But Muhammad's followers want to talk to him, even if it interferes with his sexy time. Sadly, Muhammad, the guy who brags about having sex with nine women and girls in one night, is just too shy to tell his followers to stop bothering him, so Allah has to intervene and tell them not to annoy Muhammad. Keep in mind, Muhammad is the one who's receiving these revelations. One day, Muhammad steps out and says, Guys, I have a revelation from Allah. This is Allah talking, not me. I wouldn't say any of this, but Allah will. Remember just three verses ago when Allah gave me and me alone the right to have more sexual partners than any of you gullible stooges? Well, now Allah wants you to stop coming over to my house early, and He wants you to leave as soon as dinner's over. Again, I wouldn't say any of this. I'm just too shy. But Allah's not shy. He wants all of you to stop annoying me, stop talking me to death, stop asking me questions when I've got better things to do than spend my evenings with people who are too stupid to see what's going on here. How can Muhammad make it any clearer what Allah really is in Islam? Allah is Muhammad's sock puppet, whose primary goal is to give Muhammad everything he wants. Why is Allah so obsessed with giving Muhammad, the puppet master, whatever he wants? Because Allah's a sock puppet, and that's what sock puppets do. You Muslims bow down five times per day to Muhammad's sock puppet. And when we ask how you can possibly believe that this is the true religion, you say ridiculous things like, Oh, the Quran's been perfectly preserved, and the Quran's filled with scientific miracles. Why do you say these things? Is it because you've studied the Quran and its history? Of course not. If you took the time to study, you'd know better. You believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved and that the Quran contains scientific miracles because your leaders, your imams and sheikhs, the puppeteers, keep the puppet show going for you. But instead of getting mad at them for deceiving you, you get mad at me for telling you that you're being used and manipulated. Now, I'm sick of being the bad guy all the time, so I'm not going to tell you that you need to grow up and learn to study for yourself instead of mindlessly believing what your lying leaders tell you. I wouldn't say that to you, because I want to be nice. But I'm happy to inform you that I recently received a revelation from Allah. And Allah isn't nice. He tells you what you need to hear, even if it hurts. Grow up! and learn to study for yourself instead of mindlessly believing what your lying leaders tell you. Listen to the super genius David Wood, or you're doomed! And be sure to watch this video about Muhammad's wives conspiring to remove parts of the Quran! Pretty creepy reducing Allah to a mere sock puppet, don't you think? But Surah 33 verse 21 of the Quran says that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for mankind. So if Muhammad treated Allah like his personal sock puppet, and Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for mankind, the only way we can avoid treating Allah like this is to reject Islam.